Think about the space between your backyard and the solar system we just heard about. And think about where in that in vast space you can make the greatest impact on your community, on your state, on your country, on the world. Well, I used to think that the greatest place you could make that impact would either be a state capital, where I spent a lot of time in that other state, often confused with oh, Iowa, or in the city of Washington, D.C. In fact, I admit I even ran as a candidate for the United States Senate. But I was wrong. Last year, I moderated a panel at the Clinton Global Initiative, and sitting next to me was the president of Iceland, Olafur Grimson. And he said something that resonated with me and I haven't forgotten. He said, the problem with you Americans is that you are always waiting for Washington. And he's right. We need to stop waiting for Washington. I say that because in many ways, the title of my talk today could not just be the space between your backyard and the solar system, it could be Washington, hell no. Des Moines, hell yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Draper, for that t-shirt. <laughs> if you want to change the world, I say you start with your city. Why? It's the place where the scale is large enough that you can make a broad impact, but small enough that you can make a deep impact. And the city is changing very, very fast. Why do I say that? Imagine you're coming in from the solar system, from the planet Saturn, and you're looking at Earth. You will see something very interesting. Most of the land mass of the Earth is either water or sparsely or uninhabited. We have a tendency to huddle in these small places that some have called the greatest human invention of our time, and that is cities. And they are moving very, very fast. Not everything that happens in cities is good. There are slums, there is poverty, there is traffic congestion, but there's also innovation. And what happens in that innovation is what's called super linear scaling. That's a term from the book by Jonah Lear called Imagine. Density speeds things up. People collide, ideas collide, and they become incubators of innovation. Right now, there are 65 million people being added to our cities in the world today every single year. More than half the people on the planet now live in cities. 243 million Americans live on just 3% of the land called cities. And to give you an idea how fast that is, 65 million people a year being added to the cities is equivalent to adding seven Chicagos every single year to the cities on our planet. So if you want to change your city, how do you do it? There are a lot of people, a lot of smarter than I, who have tried to work on this issue, and so I don't necessarily want to talk about the solutions today, I want to talk about the approaches. It starts with imagining the future of your city. Dan Gilbert, who wrote the book Stumbling on Happiness, says that we are the only living organisms who have the ability to actually imagine our future. My father-in-law, was a World War II prisoner of war. Mike Zone survived the prisoner of war camps when younger men and stronger men and healthier men did not. And my wife and I and her brothers and sisters often wondered how he survived when all these other men did not. And one day my wife and I decided to write a book about my father-in-law's life. He was an extraordinary man. But he didn't like to talk about his experience as a prisoner of war. It was a very private thing to him. After he died, my mother-in-law pulled out of the closet 
something she had never shown any of the nine zone children. It was his diary that he kept as a prisoner of war that you could still read, although the handwriting was faded. And there were two things that jumped out of the pages of this diary that made it very clear how Mike Zone survived when others did not. The first were the stories of the nine Zone children that he would raise, one of whom would become my wife. But even more amazing was that here was a man who loved to eat but had no idea how to cook. <laughs> but there were pages and pages and pages of recipes, graham crackers, cottage cheese, pasta. To this day, these are recipes in the Zone family. From a man who, when he came back home, couldn't have written the recipe and still didn't know how to cook. He could see beyond the barbed wire. He could see beyond the cruelty of the guards, and he could see his future. In fact, in his case, he could taste his future. The ability to see your own future is the greatest gift we can possibly have. And when I served as Attorney General of Ohio, I traveled to Ohio's prisons. I met young men and women, often boys and girls, who for prison land, it was a land beyond pain. They came from neighborhoods where they did have no sense of their future. For them, it was day to day, week to week, at best, month to month survival. Well, the greatest gift we can give a human being is the ability to see their own future, but it's also the greatest gift we can give a government, a nation, a state, or a city. And the world is changing so fast, we don't have a lot of time. From the time of dawn of civilization to the year 1800, we had about one billion people on Earth. But from literally 1800 to October 31st of last year, we reached seven billion. And to indicate how fast that's happening, the sixth billion person on Earth is 12 years old. In other words, every 12 years, we are adding another billion people to our planet. But that's not what is the most amazing. What's amazing is the information. That what's happening right now is that from the beginning of time to about 2003, think of all that information during that time. And if you think of all that information during that time, it's equal to what the information is that we generate between Monday and Wednesday of this week, according to Eric Schmidt of Google. Pretty amazing. We send over 8 billion text messages per day. That's how many text messages will be sent before we go to bed tonight, many of which are being sent right now because you're bored with my presentation. <laughs> But here's the amazing thing. Even Bong Wee, who may be the smartest person, not only in Des Moines, but perhaps in the solar system, <laughs> even Bong Wee doesn't know what I'm about to say. 42% of those text messages will have been sent by one person, my daughter, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> My son, when he graduated from Syracuse University a couple years ago, we asked, my Peggy and I asked him, what do you want to do with your life? And he said something to us I would never have thought to say in a million years to my mom and dad. But you know, he's really not unique. He's like many of you who are here at TEDx today. What Jason said, and he was dead serious, he, is he said, Dad, Mom, what I want to do hasn't been invented yet. At all, Iowa State, at the University of Iowa, at community colleges and technical schools around the world today, we are educating young men and women for jobs that do not yet exist, using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems that none of us, even Bong Wee, knows is a problem today. I don't think that's a challenge. I would argue that is an opportunity. But it means that we have to look at things a little differently, so I believe we should look at our cities as if they were a startup, despite the fact that our cities, as Leo Landis has just mentioned, are pretty old. But you always got to be thinking and managing to the hidden curves and edges. Why? Well, let's take a look at the difference between MySpace and Facebook. I can tell you that when 
back in 2004 and 2005, my wife and I talked about one thing about our daughter and nothing else, and that is whether or not she should be on MySpace. That word has not come up since I gave this presentation uh, about six months ago, because the truth is, people forget about MySpace. But around 2009, all of a sudden, there was a switch. Now, I'm not smart enough to figure out why MySpace didn't keep up with Facebook, but I have a hunch I know what part of it was. That MySpace started, stopped thinking like a startup. Just like Blockbuster might have stopped thinking like a startup as Netflix passed it in the turn. And I would argue cities need to think the exact same way. Now, there's another way to look at this. We often think, well, the difference must be technology. And yes, technology is an accelerator of change. But I would argue it's more than technology, it's your mindset. How do you view something? So let's look at the history of the high jump. A business professor at the Dartmouth Tuck School is the one who actually thought of this, not me. But I think it's a fascinating way to look at it. For example, back in 19, 1896, the way we used to jump over the, the high jump was using feet first. And then some coaches said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Why don't we try doing it side first? It became the Western rule. And some coaches said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Why don't we do it stomach first? And it became the 1936 straddle. And then in 1968, there was this young guy out of Oregon State University who said to his coaches, I just can't do this. He wasn't a very good high jumper. He would try the Western roll, and he wasn't very good. He would try the straddle. He wasn't very good. And he, he one day was experimenting and tried flying over the bar on his back. And his coach laughed at him. Most of the other kids on the team laughed at him. But the truth of the matter is, what happened was it became known as the Fosbury flop. Dick Fosbury actually reinvented how you jump over a high bar. And today, uh, virtually everybody who you will watch in London during the Olympics will be using the Fosbury flop invented in 1968. And he went literally from jumping to about six and a half feet high to seven and a half, and now the world record is about eight feet high. And we'll probably keep going, and somebody probably will invent still another way to jump over that high bar. So what the lesson is, is that everybody today, for those of you who've got an inbox, a virtual inbox, or a physical inbox, you may be thinking about that inbox right now. You're spending a lot of time, even on a Sunday, uh, when you could be doing some other things. But the truth is that we spend too much of our time managing the present and not enough time selectively destroying the past, not necessarily listening to what our coaches have said to us for years and years and years, but doing something else, and that is creating our own future. There are some terrific strategic plans that Des Moines is known for, the Des Moines Partnership and others. Some of the best actually in the country have been done right here. But every strategic plan has a shorter shelf life than it used to. They have a sell-by date, meaning that Wayne Gretzky, when he was once asked what makes him a Hall of Fame hockey player, said something that I think is profound and is the best definition I've ever heard of economic development. He said, I just learned how to skate where the puck was going, not where the puck was. And that is how cities must think. It's now all of us must think. But I actually think that it's got to be somewhat organized. There must be some structure. So I like to think that we ought to face our challenges and opportunities. We should frame them, then we should act on them, and then we should connect and we should engage. So when I say frame, I say we should identify what are your city vitals. What are the vital signs of Des Moines? that you are a connected city, an innovative city, a talented city, and a di distinctive city. Take a look at how you connect your physical capital with your human capital and your social capital. Look at the culture of entrepreneurship and innovation. Look at the number of creative professionals and the young and restless, many of whom are here today. What your college completion rate is in your educational attainment. Why? Because if you were to measure the success of a city based upon one measurement, 
per capita income, the average earnings of the people in Des Moines and the surrounding region, 58% of your success comes down to just one thing, educational attainment. Literally, the number of two-year and four-year college degrees determines the per capita income of a city more than any other factor. It's what we call sometimes the talent dividend. And then there's, of course, distinctiveness. What makes Des Moines different from every other city? We actually even measure something called the weirdness factor. Uh, in this case, weirdness is good. It's we take a look at the market research and the consumer behaviors and how much they differ from the norm behavior. And the cities where those behaviors vary the most are the weirdest. Now, we don't have Des Moines on this list uh, because you're under a million. Uh, but I can say to you that based upon my research, you're getting weirder and weirder every day. <laughs> Mike Draper is a good example of that. Uh, city, city dividends. We also believe in something called the progress principle. And that is if you move the needle just a little bit on an issue you care about, the greatest single motivator and catalyst for change is the ability to show measurable progress. Teresa Amabile, a professor at Harvard, has done some phenomenal studies, and she calls it the progress principle. So we are creating things like the talent dividend, or for example, the green dividend that says if you decrease the number of miles that people drive by one mile per day per year, it'll produce huge economic savings. Or if you reduce the poverty level by just 1%, it will have huge savings in the number of less money that you spend on government spending. But the key is also you must power this through cross-sector, cross-generational clusters and networks. Why? Because as Steve Jobs said, if you tear down walls, if you build bridges and you light fires, that is the single greatest way to affect change any place, especially a city. Now, Men's Health Magazine just recently said that you are the least vain city in America. That's impressive, but I don't think it's as good a t-shirt as this could be. A better t-shirt would be to say that you're going to be like that mother pigeon looking at the man and saying we're going to target our opportunities and say Des Moines is the most authentic, humble, and good-looking city in America. Thank you.